This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's a place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. Welcome aboard, folks. Dr. Charles Parker here one more time. And we have a very interesting guest tonight who's going to be talking about how schools and school climate and culture can affect child learning. And isn't this an absolutely topical discussion that we're going to have? So Dr. Cleet Bullock is going to be with us. Bullock, did I pronounce it right? That's correct. Is going to be with us. Um, it's a different spelling, folks. I'm getting a little messed up with his last name, and I rehearsed it and then wrote it down incorrectly. So the bottom line is Cleet is going to be telling us about this in just a second. Thanks for joining us, Cleet. We really appreciate it. Pleasure being on your show, Chuck. So here's what we're going to do, folks. Let me uh, take a couple words from our sponsors, and then we'll go right into it. As you folks know, Core Brain Journal is supported by D uh, Direct Health Access Laboratory with over 3 million studies. They are deep leaders of experience with the big picture of measuring these arcane topics. For example, methylation, cryptopyrrole, and copper challenges, which directly affect brain function. They provide a global lab service with a molecular focus. See more laboratory details at DHA Lab, singular, dhalab.com forward slash core, just like Apple Core, C O R E. And Core Brain Journal is also supported by the nonprofit Barry Robinson Center teams in Norfolk, Virginia, who provide child and adolescent residential care on an evolved family and interpersonal level, indeed global level, or TRICARE friendly. And we'll hear more about them in just a second. The innovative programs there are truly remarkable, and they're all spelled out when you go over to barryrobinson.org, B-A-R-R-Y, robinson.org, forward slash core. So we'll be talking more about them in just a moment. So without further ado, I'm going to tell you about Cleet and what we're going to talk about tonight. The greatest area of interest for Cleet is school climate and culture and their effect on student achievements. The related areas that impact climate and culture are leadership behavior, teacher caring behaviors, bullying behavior, we've talked about this before here, character related behavior, and levels of openness and trust within the school community. Surveys have been created to collect data on these student achievement related variables and with those surveys, it can help you figure out what you need to do in the school. Manuscripts, manuscripts that de describe research conducted with these data collected instruments can be found by clicking on research manuscripts at his website. So he's formed a consulting agency called the Professional Development and Assessment Center, PDAC. And this agency provides training to improve leadership skills in human relationships conflict management, and group management. Cleet, I can imagine you're busy all day every day with this because it's a big problem and schools need to get some kind of structure on, on what's actually going on in these regards. So what happens is it's designed. He has a very clear research-based design, and we're going to be talking more about how to get a hold of him in a minute. The books that he has for us, and he's going to have a giveaway, two books. One is School Climate and Culture, Vis-a-Vis -vis Student Learning, Keys to Collaborative Problem Solving and Responsibility. And the second book is Enhancing a High-Performance School Culture and Climate, New Insights for Improving Schools. I mean, who doesn't need that? I mean, this is an issue throughout the country. So, Cleet, thanks for coming on board again. Tell us a little bit how you evolved into deciding that you wanted to take a position to really tell people new directions on what they can actually do to improve school culture. How did that all take place? Uh, well, in 2002, I was invited to bid on a uh, project in West Virginia. The project was to evaluate every school district in the state. 
sure. on how they were implementing character education, which was mandated by the state. I was the successful bidder. Mm -hmm. So I bought an RV and I traveled up the hollows and byways and highways interviewing teachers and students in every school district in the state. That must have been also, fun. Oh, it was, it was fun. They could have, I could have paid somebody to let <laughs> yeah. me do that. Uh, but I got a pretty good fee for doing that. And mm -hmm. as I interviewed teachers and students, my basic question is, what do you like about school? What don't you like about school? And from the kids, I usually got going home. <laughs> yeah. uh, I also got teachers, and I when I asked what don't you like, they said teachers. I said, mm -hmm. whoa, tell me about that. And they said, well, some teachers care about us. They'll listen to us. They want to make sure that we learn, and they do everything they can to help us. And then we've got these other teachers who are there just to get a paycheck, and they are just wait, can't wait to retire. They put the feet up on their desk and look at us and say, all right, you guys, I'm here to teach. If you're here to learn, we're going to get along just fine. Mm -hmm. And I asked the teachers, what do you like about school? What do you like? What don't you like about it? And they said parents for both questions. Mm -hmm. I says, well, tell me about that. Well, some of these parents will do anything in the world for us. And then we've got these others. They just undo everything we try to do. They're, they're not supporting us. Mm -hmm. They undo stuff that we try to do with their kids. If we try to teach them honesty and truthfulness, when they go home, they see the opposite of that. And I said, well, what else do you like about school? And they said, the administration. What don't you like? The administration. So it was amazing as I went around and asked these questions. I also collected um, character education on 96 behaviors 16 sets of character traits, that's the survey I used, and that's on my site, and it's free. And I also collected culture and climate data on one school in every district in the state, equal number of high schools, middle schools, and elementary schools. When I finished with that, after five months and traveling over 5,000 miles, I thought, wow, you know, I've got a book here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I. I, I have seen some awesome schools. I need to write a book so that anybody who gets the book can jumpstart their school within one semester to be a high-performing school. Oh, fantastic. And that's the goal. So in order to do that, chapter one in book number one about school culture and climate vis-a-vis -vis student learning describes four distinct school cultures that I saw in West Virginia. Number one is the laissez-faire school. There's not a lot of control there. It's pretty loose. Number two is the traditional school. About 75% of the schools in the United States are that one today. The focus is on control by the administration, control by the teachers, control by the board, and the emphasis is on rewards and punishment. That's the traditional school. The um, Another school, which I call... Um, Hmm. It's above traditional. They, they have a system of rewards for students who do what they're supposed to do. A system of rewards for teachers who do what they're supposed to do. And that's about 10 to 15, 20% of the schools in the United States today. I saw one school, one school in the entire state that I would call a high performing school. You know what they did? They figured out a way to get the kids to control themselves. Wow. You know, when you go into a school, and if you think back on your days as a student and my mm -hmm. days as a student, when a student misbehaves, everybody looks to the teacher. What's the teacher going to do? Mm -hmm. Because for a kid to control a kid who's misbehaving, many times I say, well, what are you doing, sucking up to the teacher? You want to be teacher's pet? Get out of here. Leave me alone. So it's not okay for kids to control each other in most schools. But in this school, on the day that I went into this school, uh, they had locker time. Locker time went normally goes four to five minutes. In this case, it was going on 10 minutes. And I said to the principal, what's going on here? He says, oh, they had fewer than 25 redirects yesterday. I said, what? What's that? 
he says, you know, a teacher has to correct a kid. We call it redirect. When a kid isn't doing what they're supposed to do, the teacher has to redirect them. I says, oh, w what grade was that in? He says, no, we're talking the whole school. I says, what? He says, yeah. I says, how many students are in this school? He says, 345. I says, you mean fewer than 25 times teachers had to correct kids? He says, it's not just teachers, the cooks, custodians, everybody gives redirects. We count them at the end of the day. And if there are fewer than 25, they get 10 minutes of locker time. I says, wow. I says, that's absolutely amazing. He says, and the kids correct each other? He says, oh, yeah, they're all over each other. They'll say, where's your book? Here, here's a pencil. Did you do your homework? Call me tonight. He says, these kids will fight each other, work with each other to get those 10 minutes of locker time. They love it. Okay, now tell us what locker time is because I can't imagine chasing locker time right now. Well, uh, uh, <laughs> well you know, the kids, when they go to school, when they get in school, the first thing they do is go to their locker and get their books, get their pencils, and get their supplies, their writing paper, and all that. Well, now they get 10 minutes. Normally, it's four to five, and then go to their classroom or their homeroom. So they just get to hang out in the hallways with each other, and they just love it. And what I saw was absolutely awesome, not only during that locker time, but during the uh, lunch break. These kids work together with each other. They are kind to each other. It's just a totally different environment than you'll find in most schools today. And I thought, I've got to write this book. Absolutely. So in chapter one, I describe how to create this culture where kids control each other. And it's not hard to do. Um, I don't know that you want to get into that here because there's so much else we want to cover. But basically... I have the teachers count how many times they have to correct kids' behavior. Now, for a week. Now, for many teachers, that's 100 times. Uh, it's on average five times every hour. So the learning cycle gets broken when a teacher has to stop teaching to correct a kid. And it takes them approximately two minutes to get back into the learning curve. Yeah, get back into the content because you have so, to go off and see what's going on with the kid. You, you have lose. To forget where you were. You have to get yourself right. back. Yeah. So you lose 10 minutes every hour. You got a six hour day. That's an hour a day that's lost. On a 180 day school year, that's 30 days of instruction that's lost. Can you imagine how much learning would occur if you could add 30 days to the school year? Yeah. Well, uh, in the school system that did this, they reduce student misbehavior by 75%, okay? And um, they, they went to the kids after their, that one week and says, look, guys, we've had to stop and correct student misbehavior 100 times last week. Get that to 75, and I'll give you an extra five minutes of recess. That's elementary school. Now, at the middle school, you can give locker time, but if you're just the teacher yourself doing it, you got to come up with another reward because you can't give your kids an extra 10 minutes of locker yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, it's a pizza party, or it's walk down to uh, McDonald's for an ice cream. One of your business partners, uh, you come up with a reward for your classroom. And the kids say, you want us to help you reduce student? Yeah, I want you. I want you to help me. I'm tired of it wasting all this time correcting you. You know when you're doing wrong. So you get the kids on your side. You make it okay for them to correct each other. I call that changing the existing culture of control where kids wait on the teacher and the administration to correct misbehavior. It's not okay for them to do it. It's not only okay, you're asking them to do it. And if you think this is crazy, when I was a teacher and I had a bad day, I would go to the kids and say, I don't feel very good today. How about help me out? And they always did. When I asked them to help me, they did. I never thought about doing it every day, but this does it every day. It changes the culture and climate in that school com considerably. So if uh, the kids actually, let me interrupt, just a quick question on this. So if the kids are helping the other children, if they're helping each other out, Right. Then the, uh, the critical remarks and the control effort is not so much with the teacher. 
if the teacher diminishes the control effort, then do, what happens? How do the kids actually handle themselves in that regard to actually get the project done or to make the pivot with the other child? How does all that take place? Well, I do, I do a couple of other things. Um, the secret is to give control to the kids without giving it up, okay? Mm -hmm. You can never give it up. The administration gives control to the teachers but does not give it up. The board gives control to the administration but does not give it up. Mm -hmm. If you're a leader, you have to maintain control. That's chapter four in the book on the nine forms of power you use to control what happens in a school. We don't have time for that probably today. But um, here's one of my techniques for giving control to the kids without giving it up. I go to the kids on the first day as a teacher, and I say, what do you guys expect of me as your teacher? And, of course, any teachers listening in right now can do it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, they can say, guys, what do you expect of me as your teacher? Because the classroom today has got a mix of wealthy, poor, uh, welfare, uh, blacks, whites, Latinos, Orientals. What do those kids expect of the teacher? Mm -hmm. If the teacher knew what they expected, they could become a better teacher. Mm -hmm. So they go to the kids and what do you guys expect of me? And here's three three by five cards. Write one expectation on each card. The mm -hmm. teacher gets the card, sorts them in the common piles, and comes up with, say, 10 expectations, distinctly different expectation. Goes back to the kids and says, this is what you said you expected me. I tell you what, I am going to try to meet those expectations. The teacher gave control to the kids. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That I care about you, I'm listening to you, I am open to you, I trust you, I'm going to take the chance. To, to do this, okay? And if there's an expectation the kids have that you can't meet, you say, here's an expectation that some of you said you want me to do, but I can't do that, and here's why. Okay, so you create the relationship with the teacher and the students. Now, the second thing you do, maybe a day or two later or a week later, you go to the kids and you say, guys, I'm having trouble with the rules in this classroom. They're being broken too many times. I'll tell you what. What rules do you think we ought to have in this classroom? Here's three three-by-five cards. Write one rule on each card that you think we ought to enforce in this class. You want us to set the rules? They look at you like you're crazy, you know? Mm -hmm. I've done this. I did this as a teacher, and it works. So I get the cards, and I sort them in the common piles, and I put the ten rules up on the board. And the kids look at them. Oh. I wrote that rule. There's the rule I wrote. And all around the room, they're going buzzing at the rules that they wrote. Now, there's usually one rule they don't write. I put it in, and they don't know the difference. The rule is turn your homework in on time. <laughs> they, usually, they usually do not put that in there. <laughs> I uh, can't understand why. <laughs> no. Well, but they don't like homework. Yeah, right. And many teachers uh, don't treat homework properly. When I was a teacher and I gave homework, the first thing we did was grade the homework in class that day. Um, so they got immediate feedback. I know teachers who keep homework for a week to two weeks before returning it. By then, if the kids made a mistake, they, they don't know what mistake they made. So it, there's no good feedback. Anyway. So I've got the kids working for me. They've set the rules. I know what they expect. We've got a good relationship. Um, that's the culture and the climate I want in the classroom, a healthy relationship between the teacher and the kids because the kids have to know that I'm working for them. If the kids think they, have, they are working for me, if you just – Think about that difference in their relationship. Kids think the teacher is working for them. The kids believe they're working for the teacher. That's a flip flop. It's a big deal. I'm telling you, I'm I'm listening to you, Cleet, and I am thinking about stuff that I do every single day in my practice. And really, what you're talking about is the same thing needs to take place in medicine. Now, I mean, I see this happen all the time because I tell the person that comes in, I've got some knowledge, but I'm working for you. I'm going to tell you how we can work together. 
And you then need to tell me what the issue is so we can get it squared away. But if I tell you how to communicate effectively with me, I'm giving you the control to tell me what to do. I tell kids, I want you to tell me what to do. I'm training you to tell me what to do. Now, you've got to know what to tell me, which is part of the situation. If you know what to tell me, my job is just simply to listen to you. It makes my job much easier. Same thing that we're talking about, Cleet. That's right. I call it servant leadership. Uh, that concept is out there. There is a place in Indiana that has a servant leadership center in Indianapolis. Is that right? You can look it up on the, uh, on the web. Um, and what you just said was fascinating, uh, Dr. Chuck. Um, we're talking about communication, which is in book number two, I ran across the two biggest problems with any type of change in the schools. It's a lack of communication and dealing with conflict. Now, in a lack of communications, that's chapter one. There are five basic communication skills, and I bet you you use all of them, but you've probably never thought about it. Yeah, no, that's true. When, I'm, when, I'm looking forward when to it. When somebody yeah. says something to you, when they come to you and they say something about their emotional or physical state, do you paraphrase? Did, did I hear you say this? You, yeah. you just paraphrase it, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's number one. Number two, behavior description. You see somebody do something in your office, and you might think, God, that was a stupid thing. That was a stupid thing to do. And if you say that, the person immediately gets on the defensive, right? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, but what if you said, you know, when I said this, this is what I saw you do, and you describe the behavior, and you drop it right there. You wait. You describe the behavior that you saw, and you wait for the person, the patient, to respond. Mm -hmm. Because if you tell them what you thought it was, they're going to get defensive. Mm -hmm. But if you describe the behavior, you it's open. The door is open. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've done that, haven't you? Yeah, oh yeah. Okay. Description of feelings is the third one. If you describe how you feel, to a patient, you, you say, you know, I'm really upset over the fact that you're not following your medication. Bang, you drop it on them. Yeah. They have to respond. Have you ever done that? I don't really talk about how I feel much, to tell you the truth. I'm okay. interested in your reaction to it. I'll tell you why. Because, you know, I came from a psychoanalytic background. My deal is I always try to get them to tell me what their issue is because if they're not doing something i'm assuming that they're having a problem with me personally in terms okay. of i didn't give them proper good information or i'm somehow not listening effectively i take it on myself that there's something i'm not doing okay. they have to tell me what it is because they want to get better and if i'm going to help them get better they have to tell me what their problem is with me okay well, it may work better in your family situation with kids and grandkids and, and wives and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, describing feelings allows them to respond to your feelings. Mm -hmm. okay. It's more personal when you do that. Yeah, uh, yeah. A fourth communication skill I call perception checking, and I'm sure you've done that. Um, you Let's say you did something or said something in the office and you verbally you, you read nonverbal behavior in the patient. You say, did I just say something that upset you? Yeah. You ever do that one? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's the fourth one. Now, the fifth one is giving and receiving feedback. A very difficult thing to do. Getting good feedback is very difficult. Now, um, what I used to do when I was a teacher and when I was a principal and a school superintendent I would use a thing that I call um, force field analysis. It goes back to Kurt Lewin, 1957. It's a very complicated system that he's come up with. Here's a very simplified version of force field analysis. I went to the employees. I went to my students. Mr. Bulock is a good teacher because. Complete that sentence as many times as you wish. Mr. Bulock would be a better teacher if. Complete that sentence as many times as you wish. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I would get this from all my students. And, and when I was a high school uh, German teacher, that was over 100. Mm -hmm. 
okay? I would have to sit down and sort those out. Some of the kids loved me, and I had to throw those away because there was nothing there. You know, I was just, I was just terrific. And I had a few who hated me. So mm -hmm. I threw those out. But I get the feedback. I got feedback. I did that as a principal and as a superintendent. And the feedback I got allowed me to change my leadership behavior to pick up on the forces for is good because or try to remove would be better if. Mm -hmm. So I got mm -hmm. good feedback. Now, giving feedback is also very difficult. And in the book on chapter two, or one, I give about 10, 10 rules of giving feedback. Uh, <clears throat> So giving and receiving feedback is a very important tool. And using the force field analysis is one way to find out what teachers believe you should be, you are doing right and what you could do better if you're an administrator. Well, and if you're a teacher, what you could do better as a teacher. So those, those are, um, where would you like to go from here? Well, what you're doing is you're saying some interesting and really what I'm thinking about is we got to read this book. This is a person needs, this is not something you're going to get in a half hour, 45 minute uh, discussion because I don't know what you do on your consultation levels, but I can imagine taking a full day to work through these things and, and try them out, do some role playing and so on because it kind of goes against the vertical management situation that's oh, so, absolutely. And, absolutely. And, there, and a person has to wind up being humble. They've got to be vulnerable. They've got to show they care. That's where the feeling thing comes in. And, you know, and it's really amazing to me because I guess I do say feelings from, I was thinking about that whole conversation you and I had a moment ago because I do confess that I care about the outcome. I want them to get better. That's yeah. why I'm here. You know, so the issue is somewhere in there. I, I do say that uh, occasionally. But well, the caring, issue is actually being vulnerable with a person is what it comes down to. And people have to practice that, I would imagine. Yeah, you have to, you have to let people know that you are open. You know, openness has two dimensions. There is a listening dimension and a telling dimension, okay? Many people are open on the telling dimension, but not on the listening. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, many administrators... Uh, people would accuse Trump of being closed on the listening dimension, but high on the telling. I think that's wrong. Mm -hmm. If you get right down to it, I think well, he is open. Explain that one to me, because that's definitely something I would say. Trust has five dimensions. Uh, th these are all described in, in the book, and I'm going to give you one technique to use that anybody listening, whether you're a parent, whether you're a minister, whether you're a doctor, I don't care what you are, one simple technique that will improve levels of openness and trust. Trust has five dimensions. There is a truthfulness dimension. Uh, President uh, Clinton failed on that one. Mm -hmm. There is an ability dimension, but he was pretty good on that one. Mm -hmm. There is a, uh, an overall character dimension that I call authenticity. Dealing with caring, do you come across as an authentic person? And just in my brief encounter with you, you do. You come across as who you are. Mm -hmm. I would trust you on that dimension. Mm -hmm. um, there is a predictability dimension, and that's a serious one because absolutely, if if you are unpredictable on how you deal with problems, the problems aren't going to come to you. If they know how you're going to behave, they'll bring you the problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, then there's the big one is confidentiality. Um, those are the five trust dimensions. There's an openness and trust survey on my uh, website that's free. You can use it to find out how open and trusting a group is. You can modify it to find out levels of openness and trust between the leader and the followers. Um, so that's free as well. That was my doctoral dissertation way back when. On, I was looking at the relationship of openness, trust, and risk taking. <laughs> well, that's it's totally interesting. I mean, that is so interesting. Well, it's mean, such a broad application. I mean, we started this conversation talking about schools, but I mean, this thing is 
absolutely so relevant for ordinary conversations. I mean, if you look at medicine right now, one of the reasons people don't want to go see the doctor is because it's not, it's not 100% what I'm going to talk about, but the problems that exist are based on vertical management. No question about it. Mm-hmm. And, and so you got a vertical management. Now, there's some people that want vertical management because they don't want to think, but far more want the conversation, want to have some input and have the person be authentic on a certain level, open and vulnerable, and listen. It's a, it's, we're talking about human relations. That's what we're uh, talking about. Yeah. The whole, both books are human relations. Here's the technique that I think you're going to love. Maybe you've tried it. I don't know. I call it the positive minus and interesting. You ever heard of it? No. Yeah. Okay. Anytime you meet with a group, and I'm sure you do, and you want to start it off with a nice activity that's going to get everybody feeling good about each other, you use the PMI and you say, guys, let's start our meeting with a PMI activity today. A positive minus and interesting, okay? Uh, I tell you what, I want you to think about something positive that happened to you in the past week and you can set the time frame anywhere you want, over the summer if you want, in the past day or whatever. you. The length of time is for you to set. Well, something positive that happened to you. Something minus that happened to you and something interesting that happened to you okay Mm -hmm. now when you have that in your mind give me a thumbs up okay and then Mm -hmm. i'm going to ask you to share your positive minus and interesting now that works fine if you've got a small group say six to ten if you've got a group of 30 you can't waste that much time Mm -hmm. so you put them in groups of five or six and you ask, ask them to share with each other, their PMI, okay? What you're trying to do here is relationship. You're building relationships between the people. You're getting them to be open. They are having to listen to each other, okay? And they are telling their openness and trust is being formed, okay? They are understanding each other. They're finding out that they care about each other. Then when they share it, oh, I never knew that about you. Wow, but you legitimize the minus. It is okay to share a minus, but it's also okay to brag a positive. Mm -hmm. And the interesting one is the interesting one. You never know what that's going to (laughs) be. But if you're doing the group thing, you you tell each of the groups, appoint a leader in your group or someone in your group who will share the positive that your group thought was the most one, that one that needs to be shared, a minus that your group thinks needs to be shared, and an interesting that your group thinks needs to be shared. So you go to which group wants to start? So you go to group number one, or, and they share a positive, a minus, and an interesting. So there had to be some listening there for somebody to share that. So now the whole group gets to do that, and they get to understand a little bit of what life is like with all the people in those groups out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and if you're the person leading the group, you share your positive minus interesting as a role model. Mm-hmm. Uh, you share yours. I'm going to share mine just so you have an idea of how to do this. Okay. And then you go around until everybody, that's what I call building relationships in a group, openness and trust. Mm-hmm. And you can do that over and over and over. So That's you would pull that. You would use that as a. Uh, that would be a tool that you would use if you felt that the a group was is somehow becoming uh, challenging, disingenuous, uh, mixed in their relationship with each other. You could just do that process and start all over, sort of clean the slate and come back because then everybody's going to wind up being connected with each other because they're going to be in a more authentic relationship. Right. Very good. I'm guessing. I didn't know. I was just like, no, you're you're right on target. Um, It's too bad, but many people don't know what's going on in the lives of the people they work with every day. That's so true. And, you know, uh, just to legitimize sharing the negative, just to legitimize being able to brag, Mm-hmm. And opening it up for interesting, 
Mm -hmm. It's amazing what this does to build relationships within your group and between you and them because you're listening to them. You're saying, I care about you guys. I want to know what's going on with you. I want to know how your day was. I want to know more about you all mm -hmm. because you're trying to set up a cooperative relationship because in many cases, this uh, tiered uh, uh, system that we have is so competitive. People are watching their back because everybody is out to impress the boss and, you know, score big on this vertical system. And it just isn't working. And in high schools today, the competitiveness that's there between kids is awesome. And it's bad. You, but you don't want to get rid of competitiveness. You want to, you want to focus on being cooperative so kids work together. I call this school the citizenship school because from kindergarten on, these kids have opportunity after opportunity to work together as good citizens. And when they get out, they've had 12 years of being good citizens. In the current system, we graduate students who have a what's in it for me mentality. It's com competitiveness, dog eat dog all the way through. No opportunities for cooperation except in maybe the uh, extracurricular activities, such as sports and debate and so forth. But if you infuse that throughout the system for 12 years, you're going to have kids graduating who know how to work together. And it, I, it's our whole culture right now, it's dog eat dog. Look what's happening with our in our governments. Yeah. People fighting each other. Yeah. They're not working together. It's just awful. Well, you know, Clint, I have a question for you. This is so interesting. I haven't interrupted to, to put this little piece in here, but I've got a question for you. I mean, you're so right, and I have some observations that are ger pardon me, germane to what you're talking about, and which I'll share with you in just a moment. But one of the questions I want to ask, and I think is, as people are listening to this, it's very easy to get hooked up with you on this because it is so commonsensical, because, and it's so authentic and real, and you've got it so well organized. You know, I can think of a number of places, applications for it, but here's the question I want to ask when we get back. And this is kind of a hard question. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I think what's going on in everybody's minds, I've got an, he doesn't know it, but I've got an intractable position here with this. I've got a group that is totally whacked out. I mean, they're fighting with each other. They're freaked out. They don't have any respect for me. They're not going to listen to me for anything. And I'm wondering what the heck I'm going to do. And I'm going to come back and ask you, what would a pro like yourself say would be the first step when we get back? So we're going to take a break now. We're going to ask what you would say, how you would handle a very tough situation like that. When well, we'll use Donald Trump as the what I would tell him if he were to ask me that. Oh, that's great. We'll come back and you can tell us that. I'm looking forward to it. So let's take a break right now. Back in a second, folks. Well, folks, you know as well as I do that psychiatric treatment failure, especially after multiple medication trials and those very, very brief hospitalizations, may prove insufficient to deal at home with the complexity of troubled children and, and those adolescents from 6 to 17 years old. Improve care, those next mandatory steps should include a more comprehensive approach to address those multiple levels of challenges, from family to peers to school, diagnostically from defiance to depression on every level for families, including military families internationally. The Barry Robinson Center's 32-acre open college-like campus in Norfolk, Virginia, provides safety and security and clean, comfortable living how do we know we refer folks over there all the time, strongly endorse what they're doing? So for further information and informed interview, connect at this page, barryrobinson.org forward slash core. Well, you folks already know that here at Core Brain Journal, we're on a mission to introduce you to resources that make significant contributions to the investigation of those predictable mind science applications. Our colleagues at DHA Lab Group provide a real difference with treatment options for people at every level, from first awareness of mind problems to those frustrating times when even well-informed treatment becomes surprisingly unpredictable. For my entire professional life, from psychoanalysis to brain scans, I've searched for 
Yes, improved predictability. The good news for all of us, from professionals to patients, remarkably effective research offers useful, cost-effective, organic options far beyond guesswork with psychiatric medications alone. DHA lab tests measure unbalanced biomedical details through easily available testing, now available globally for a variety of molecular answers from, for example, methylation, copper, and cryptopyrrole challenges. Check in for more details at dhalab.com core. That's d-h-a-l-a-b.com forward slash core. Well, Cleet, I think we caught the listener's attention on that one because who isn't interested in that kind of idea? What a serious tease that was, my friend. So what would you tell <laughs> Donald Trump, well, who is leading the entire free world in a certain respect? I would say leading in, question, in quotation marks, trying to lead in his own brand of leading. So what would you do in a situation like this? Okay. Which is, well, let's use, yeah. let's use an, the intractable group, the news media, okay? Uh, yeah. Okay. How does he repair his relationship with the news media? Mm -hmm. If I were Donald Trump, this is my, would be my advice to him, or to any leader who's got an intractable group where they don't trust the leader, mm -hmm. uh, they, they're out to undermine, okay, you've got to get them on your side somehow. The expectations diagnosis that I describe in chapter two in book one is the best way to do that. If I were Donald Trump, I would bring the news media in for a social gathering. Uh, I might even start with the PMI, just, just, just to find out what's out there. Mm -hmm. What the positive and minus and negatives are with the news media. Try to get a warm, fuzzy feeling going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it wouldn't take too long, maybe 15 minutes at most. And then I would say, guys, you know, uh, my relationship with you all needs to be improved. And quite frankly, I'm not sure how to go about that. But I, I tell you what I'd like to do. I'm going to give you three three by five cards. And on each card, I'd like for you to write down what you expect of me as the president in relating to the news media. You can write one thing on each card. If you want more cards, I will give you more cards. And then you just let them write. You know, just stop right there. I can tell you that is so revealing. And so as you sink into it, as you identify with it, if you have a moment where you get into the mind of that situation, that is more vulnerability. Yeah. Right there. And then the, and they're going to, he says, basically, I'm going to take some feedback. You know, and I'm, I'm sorry I interrupted you, but it was just so evocative to think about somebody actually saying that who is doing the dance of the leader. Go ahead. I'm sorry I interrupted you. I got well, excited. you're giving control to them, but you're not giving it up. And that's the secret to being a leader. You have to give control to the people below you, but you cannot give it up. As a parent, you have to give control to your kids, but you cannot give it up. Once you give up control, you're lost. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if a teacher gives up control in the classroom, and doesn't control the kids when they're supposed to do it. They know they'll that teacher's lost. Um, <clears throat> so all throughout the books, I give different scenarios of how to give control without giving it up. So that's just one. Um, now, if if you wanted to go farther, let's say on a second meeting with the media, mm -hmm. uh, another social. I would probably go to them and say, uh, President Trump is, Mr. Trump is doing a good job as president because, complete that sentence as many times as you want. He would do a better job if, complete that sentence as many times as you want. So get out from the news media what access they've got to grind. Mm -hmm. Are you doing anything that they like? Now, <clears throat> I use this technique as a teacher, as a principal, and as a superintendent. Now, my goal was to increase good because forces for. I wanted more things there, and I wanted to reduce would be better if. I focused on the better if, but if I had some good because, I tried to reinforce those to get even better at good because. Uh, so you want to reduce 
the better ifs and increase good because. So at some point down the road, maybe a year later or six months later, I would go back and do it again. Of course, he could do all this with his cabinet too. Yeah, that would be, you know, if he wanted to keep it private, just do it with his cabinet. Yeah, he should do this with his cabinet. Yeah, Uh, that's that's just an amazing set of techniques. I mean, it's just, it's, it has a a quality of, uh, you know, basically the person maintains their leadership, but has a certain measure of vulnerability. I mean, that is what you started when you started talking about it. And it's pretty doggone clear. That's where you are with it. If a person asks this, they're saying, look, I really do want to connect with you. And I want this to be a human to human conversation as opposed to any of these games. And because I'm asking you, I'm in a leadership position. I'm willing to take feedback. And I'm not setting you up to do anything except tell me what I can do to improve what I'm doing. And, and that changes the game considerably because yes, the, game is, the game right now is I know what I'm doing. You guys are all screwed up, nothing personal. I'm just going to have to tell you you're screwed up. And I mean, if you go back to President Obama and his relationship with Congress, he wasn't listening to them at all. Mm-hmm. He was on the openest dimension. It was tell, tell, tell. I've got the pen. I'm going to tell you guys. Mm-hmm. Now, to some extent, Trump is doing that too. Mm-hmm. But when he gets disgusted with where things are going, uh, he signs into law an executive order, you know. Uh, the latest one uh, on that health care one where he uh, put in an executive order on that that some people are, you know, not too happy about. Anyway, um, what else would you like to touch on? Well, you're really hitting it point. I mean, I think what happens is when you you're the the elements of what you're talking about are so operationally useful on relationships across the board. I mean, this book needs to be a part of every school. How do you actually do a consultation? You, I mean, it, it sounds like your business must be consultation, and and you you actually still go into a school system and. And do you, I, you take I usually, a day or what do you do? My, I can charge anywhere from five thousand to a thousand to nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, money is not the objective, you know. I, I am seventy nine years old. I'm independently wealthy. I do not need money. So you, if anybody wants me to come and can't afford it, I'll come for nothing. Um, I. I'm giving back. That's all I'm doing. I'm a, I'm hopefully coming across as a servant leader. I am here to serve my country. I'm here to serve the school system. I have one objective left in my life, and that's to change the way schools operate. This top-down uh, thing uh, that exists in so many schools, that's 75% of the schools that I visited in West Virginia were top-down. It was all about control. Now, and you can just ask yourself and just think for a minute. The more you try to control someone, the more they resist. Yeah, that's true. The more you give control, the more they're motivated. Mm -hmm, That's true. The more you give responsibility and allow them to make decisions, the more responsible they become. So when you talk about culture and climate, uh, uh, The analogy I use in the book is that of an iceberg. If you think of school climate, when you go walk into a school, you feel something. You see the way people interact. But you don't know what the culture is. The culture is what causes that climate to be what it is. If you think of an iceberg, climate is what you see above the water. What's below the water is the culture. That's so true. When you go to your employees and say, what do you guys expect of me as your principal? What do you students expect of me as your teacher? You're asking them, what do you value and believe should happen between us? Mm -hmm. That's the culture. And the classrooms we have today with the mix of students out there, you have teachers have no clue what those kids expect. So they tell them what they expect. Control. Well, and, I, and one of the things that was occurring to me, and because and, uh, you don't know me in this regard, but one of my major pet peeves is uh, the whole diagnosis by appearances thing. And everything you're talking about is 
contrary to diagnosis by appearances. Because what happens is if you really want to know that human being in the chair across the room, you can't be just judging them how they look on the outside. In fact, that's what's going on in all these examples that you've been giving is that the appearances are what the tail is wagging the dog, whereas the relationships is out, are out the window most of the time. So the yeah. people are then, I'm going to control the appearances. So then they have a disingenuous overall strategy because appearances are the thing that are going to win the day. And really what happens is that appearances are the thing that are going to in, entirely corrupt the entire situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's human nature. We, we look at somebody and we, we see their nonverbal behavior, the way their body is carried, their facial expressions, and we make a judgment based on appearance. Now, perception checking, when you come up with that judgment, you need to go to the person and say, I noticed that you appear to be feeling a little uncomfortable. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Perception check. Mm -hmm. You know, get them to open up, to find out what's going on inside. Mm -hmm. That's what you got. That's where perception checking really comes into play. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, but most people don't. They don't no. perception check. Yeah, because what happens is they're not communicating on that level of how you're actually thinking and feeling. I mean, right. that's they're just like, this is my perception and this is what it is, and I'll talk to you yeah. later. I got to go. Yeah. Well, you know, Cleet, unfortunately, we have to wind up. I mean, this has been a doggone interesting conversation. You know, it's funny how we started this whole thing. It's like, okay, school climate and culture, you know, it sounds like something that is – you know, almost uh, too superficial to even think about because it's the mind, my mind goes into how in the heck is this guy going to tell us about this because there's so many issues going on, but you've really distilled it down into some operational strategies that are so utilitarian. I mean, you know, it's one of these things that anybody could go do with any sense at all, and they make so much common sense. It's just, it's just pretty doggone amazing. So I want to express my appreciation for your coming on board. This is going to be a very big, a very frequently listened to episode, I can tell you that. And we're going to do everything we can to get it out to whatever schools and whatever's going on with educational groups out there. So where would we have people go to connect with you, Cleet? Say this. Well, you can go to Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble for the books. Uh, if you want an autographed copy, send me an email and uh, check for 50 bucks, and I'll send you two autographed copies. Um, I'm all over the web. Uh, you, my my website should be out there. Uh, all of my publications are out there somewhere. You just get on the web and put my name in, and, and you should be able to find me. So let me just double check because I, I want to say that to people here because we got several different. Uh, you got westga.edu, edu, uh, Bullock. I'm trying to see where your. Uh, where your website is is that the it's one westga.edu front slash tilled c bullock that's my website okay good i'll get i saw that only at the last minute because i was looking around for it and i'll get that on the web I, i'll get that on the, but if you just put dr clint b-u-l-a-c-h you're going to be in great shape that's going to be the way you can get together so yeah, it's, uh, don't say Clint. It's Cletus. Cleet. Did I say Clint? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. No. I get called Clint more than I get called Cleet. No. I like Cleet. That's a good, that's a great country name. I was, I joked my son. I told him I really should have called him Clyde. <laughs> we, I had, I had a great yeah. uncle named Clyde. I always thought that name was great. It's a little it bit like, yeah. But anyway, well, Cleet, thank great. you. You've been a great interviewer. I appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. You are a very, very clever guy. He puts together some really interesting stuff, and, and I know a lot of people are going to appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Core Brain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because, as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive, misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications, like those written for ADHD, are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF 
packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.